Great. So I just want to say hi to everyone and welcome again. And I'm going to hand you over to Madeline, to, who is going to present our parenting seminar uh, about Sangobitis separation anxiety. This will be, this is being recorded and we'll have this up on YouTube. We will be sending you out the YouTube link along with Randwick Council's parenting calendar, which has a lot of free parenting workshops, some of them face-to-face, -face, for example, infant CPR, some of them by webinar. It's really a fabulous resource. I also encourage everyone to come onto our website, to our What's On page. We have fabulous uh, free events for families, children and parents and of all ages. Um, so have a look at our What's On calendar. So Madeline, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over, hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is a little webinar on helping your child with separation anxiety. And just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. You're on silent, as is usually the case in a webinar. And Carolyn's my assistant. And if you use the Q&A function, which should be an option at the bottom of your screen, I think, um, to ask questions, we'll take, if we have a little bit of time at the end, which we usually do, we will um, take a look at your questions and read out, read them out. And I can have a go at answering them. And just to say that I also do really love to hear from you. And if we don't get to your questions or if they're a little complicated or if you'd like to get a sense of what other help you can get, you're always welcome to contact me. So I am today working from Wongal land of the Eora Nation and uh, these the, the Indigenous people who were here um, for many, many, many centuries before uh, the, most of the rest of us got here, they looked after the land incredibly well. And um, I like to acknowledge that we gain from what they have lost and from what they have done and continue to do. And welcome care of uh, Google Translate. Feel free to get in touch and tell me I've got something wrong. I am language disabled and only have English. So welcome from wherever you are. It's lovely to have you here. And I do like to start from uh, where things are for you and the truth about you because as parents we really um, I think we worry a lot there's a number of things we do one of them is worry and the other is um, feeling bad about ourselves and that's something which we probably carried into parenting from earlier in our life and it gets to look really real once we're parents because the places where we struggle end up playing out um, in the direction of and to the disadvantage of the people we love most and actually the situation is that you don't get nearly enough help you don't get nearly enough support you don't get nearly enough space to think about the incredibly important work that this is and if there were more support for both you and for the young people that you're raising and looking after in the world um, things would be very different so the truth about you is that you are a good parent you're a good parent <laughs> and you have always done the very best that you can you will have many times done worse than you would have liked but if you could have done better, you would have. And sometimes getting a different perspective, which I hope uh, the hand-in-hand -hand approach can help with, and sometimes getting some really practical but very flexible tools, which hand-in-hand -hand can also help with, that makes a really big difference. 
to how you handle the very real struggles and difficulties that you face. You're not to blame for these. You're not to blame for a rigid school system that your kid has trouble going to, for any number of other big things that happen out in the world that affect what it's like to try and parent. Parenting's the pointy end of a whole lot of stuff that happens out there. A whole lot of unintended consequences end up with a sharp pointy end in our families and we end up feeling that it's our personal fault that things are difficult. But things are difficult because the world's not organised well around young people. I just remember it's better now there's often Westfield has toilets that have basins that children can reach. But I remember having to haul a child up to get their hands washed. Just that every time you needed to take your child to the toilet is an ex just a really small example of the way the world is just not set up for parents and young people. And someday you will get a little rest. I can tell you it does get easier. Mine's 20 nearly 20 and it is easier oops oh I want to get that one um this is my dear husband <laughs> this is him getting a little rest whenever we go to visit our friends who have a very comfortable couch so hopefully you get to do that sometimes and as Carolyn said after the webinar we are we'll send out a recording and uh some links to resources and your always welcome to book a short free consultation with me. I can get a better picture of your circumstances and help you find the resources that will be most useful to you. Um, it's one of my favourite things to do. So feel free. We'll send you, you can follow that link. If you want to write it down and we will send you out some info with how to get in touch with me. And just to say that at the beginning, we all, we all make mistakes uh, with the best of intentions as parents. And this darling little duck took her little ducklings out for a walk and encountered a hazard, a challenge she hadn't factored on and hadn't planned for. And it ended up badly. <laughs> Hopefully this doesn't happen to you, but our aim, my aim here is to help you avoid and recover from what you might call your parenting fails. And for me, one of the most important pieces is your power to help to, to, to yourself recover from the places where things haven't gone so well and to help your children recover from those. We are very focused on trying to prevent harm and that's important, but a lot of it's out of our control. What's in our control is how well we can help our children recover. So my aim today is to talk about why the challenge of separating from our young people or their, their challenge in separating from us is hard and, is, and give you some pointers as to how you can help. Um, you can help by preparing and using play and listening, certain kinds of play and listening to build safety into your relationship with your child and um, get some support for yourself in that process. And you can also uh, get ahead of the game by bringing it on. So you don't have to wait until your child is about until you're about to leave to tackle the feelings that are coming up for your child around having to be away from you in fact because almost by definition as soon as your child is aware that you uh, are going to leave or that they're going to have to separate that's when they begin to have feelings and you can you can get things so that you give them a chance to work through those feelings at a time of your choosing instead of being hijacked by it. We call it the long goodbye. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And just a little about me. This is uh, my husband and, and my daughter when she was somewhat younger than she is now, my little cherub. 
Um, I have done all sorts of different things, but the best thing I ever did was become a parent, which I did rather later than I would advise. I have worked with the hand in hand approach for over 30 years. I did a lot of work with families prior to becoming a parent. And oh, she's more than 18. She's nearly 20. Um, and I was very inspired, though, by having my own child and seeing these tools work in my family life and seeing how she knew what to do. She had a sense of what it was that needed to be done to get things the way she needed them to be so that she could go out into the world and be confident. And once you become a parent, you connect with other parents and you start to share what you know and they share what they know. And before I knew where I was, I was um, teaching this approach, which I do love to do. So you can learn more by uh, visiting me at my website. Um, I can recommend some short online courses, which Hand in Hand provide. Um, it's a US-based organisation with... Um, instructors all over the world, of which I am one. Um, so get in touch with me and I can tell you a little more about that. And um, I've got some more info. These links will be sent out to you afterwards, um, giving you a picture of some of what I've talked about today and you can download the slides from there. And as I said, um, do make some time to come and chat with me. I'd love to meet you. So just a little bit little sort of uh, introduction to hand in hand parenting uh, in case you've not met us before. Uh, we, I call it the love triangle. <laughs> um, so at the bottom of this triangle, if we start down the bottom, <laughs> um, is the support that you need to have the foundation to, to, to parent well. Uh, it's support which will allow you to deal with how emotional the parenting project is, to gain better understandings of what's going on and to make some plans about what needs to happen. And then with our children, we have this balance of connecting and correcting, really. Connecting is incredibly important and many of the difficulties um, in family life can be um, smoothed by increasing your child's sense of connection with you. And we teach a couple of child-directed play ways of playing that deeply build your relationship and with your child. And the short version is what they'll do is carry that sense of connection with them through the process of having to leave you and being away from you. And then uh, the flip side of a process of connecting with your child, which is largely about going your child's way, there's limit setting. Um, limit setting isn't this mean, harsh, nasty thing. Limit setting is the process of getting in the way of your child when they're heading in a direction that doesn't make sense. It's not a workable direction. Generally, if your child's on a track that doesn't make sense, it means that they're, they've got feelings which are getting in the way of, um, of, of their thinking. So what you need to learn how to do is set limits so that some of those feelings can be brought up out to the into the open and offloaded. Your children's upsets are part of a process of offloading those tensions and then your child will be better able to think. You know, a sign of a child who can think well is a child who can remember that you will always come back to them and that they are going to be fine while you're away. So that's an example in this context. Um, connection is profoundly important. It's what makes the world go round. Um, we, we, I was just struck by a, a little piece of research where they'd, they'd followed the movement patterns of twins in utero and 
they the the twins react differently to one another than they do when they come in contact with the world around them, which is their mother's womb. It's like they know that there's another human being there and they interact in with different patterns of interaction with each other than with the house that they're living in. We're deeply oriented to others. And I think, you know, it's getting a little bit uh, further away now, but the experience of social distancing certainly brought home to me how incredibly important even the most ordinary levels of connection are. But basically with your child, they need a really strong um, line into you and line out from you that they'll hang on to through life's ups and downs. So connection greases the wheels of family life. And separation then is kind of the flip side of that. Um, it's a big deal. I think it's one of the major emotional projects for little ones as they go from being completely dependent little newborns through to, you know, older kids. <laughs> um, and it, and it, comes in waves so it's 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 inevitable and it actually doesn't make sense to to put it off um it's inevitable it's really important it happens over and over and you may work through some period of you know your child's um, development stretches them out and they they will feel the challenge of separating from you more and you can work through them through that with them and they'll be okay for a while and then they'll um, need again to be uh, you know that they, then they'll stretch out again and they'll be feeling the separation from you so separation is inevitable important it's critical they've got to get to the point where they can handle the world without you it's repeated it comes in layers and it's deeply felt by, by both boys and girls I think boys are somewhat trained in our culture not to show their sadness and grief and many other feelings but basically boys feel it just as deeply as girls do and we can think about tackling the challenge of helping our children with feelings about separation by understanding that basically what you've got with your child is a relationship bank balance. Um, there are lots of struggles. If, if, if there are lots of struggles and you're finding yourself having to set a lot of limits, it, I, I like that the, the, connect, the credit in the bank account is connection. When there's not enough connection, you'll find there's a lot of struggles and you'll have to be setting a lot of limits and a lot of upsets. Um, when there's a sense of closeness, of, of connection, you'll get an, a smoother time. So there's a sense of closeness and cooperation when a child feels connected. The trick is that what makes a child feel less connected isn't necessarily straightforward. Um, but that is the thing that needs to be focused on is what do I need to do to build connection credits in my relationship? Because when you set a limit, when something has to happen that your child doesn't want to do, um, you will you will borrow from the deposit, the connection deposits that you've put in the bank account. So when you set a limit, by definition, you're going against what your child wants to do. So uh, you borrow from that. If you want your relationship to stay in good shape, there needs to be plenty of connection credit in the bank account, which you borrow from when you have to set that limit. And separation is really basically a limit setting exercise. I actually think most of the challenges of parenting are fundamentally useful to think about as limit setting exercises. And then there's, okay, how connected are we? How are we going to go if I set this limit? Have we got enough connection credit for it to keep, for our relationship to stay strong as I provide this bit of extra direction? So, uh, it's also useful to understand 
the short version is upsets are part of the process. Upsets are not a sign that there's anything wrong at at all, really. Well, there could be. But anyway, mostly upsets are a sign that your child is offloading emotional tension, which is getting in their way of, of whatever it is that needs to happen. In this case, you know, confidently going off into their day without you. Um, or sleep issues are often separation issues. Happily having a brief little bedtime routine and happily going off to sleep and ideally staying asleep until a reasonable hour in the morning. Um, though sleep is often a separation issue. So basically the way children's emotions work is that stressful experiences create emotional tension and it's pretty difficult for us to really understand what, what is stressful for a young person because we just take our knowledge of the world, our experience, um, our bigness and capacity to get what we need, we take that for granted. But if you're a little person in a big person's world, all sorts of experience, and you, and you don't have a lot of information about the world or experience to draw from, all sorts of experiences can be stressful. But Children also, if they've had a hard start in life or had some kind of particularly stressful experience, we could call it traumatic. I, I worry a bit about the language of psych psychology creeping into, into general sort of the language we use. Um, you know, it's not a trauma for your child to be separated from you in the normal course of daily life. Um, but they may have had a hard start in life and that will mean they've got a big backlog of feeling, perhaps in their emotional backpack, you could call it. And further challenges in life will remind them of that and uh, make it difficult for them. And you can help them work through those those the, the feelings that they're carrying in their emotional backpack. So children carry stressful experiences and those experiences are sort of, you could call them sticky. If we don't tackle them um, and sometimes we, we just can't figure out how to or we don't know how to, um, but if we don't tackle them, they tend to get bigger and they'll, drive what we call off-track behavior. So a child who, who really won't go to sleep, whose bedtime routine is getting longer and longer and longer, or who is um, remains unhappy when you've left them um, at daycare. Um, the, the, the initial upset actually isn't necessarily something to worry about. But if a child can't pull themselves out of that upset and stays unable to enjoy the experience that they're having, say at daycare or preschool or school, then that's off track. They're not able to pull themselves out of that feeling. The feeling is really too big for them to manage. So what happens is that over time, the emotional backpack just gets heavier and heavier. And a way a child will try to work on that, they, they really don't want to be carrying around this heavy backpack of feelings. And so what children, but they often can't articulate what it is that they're scared of or worried about and they'll choose small issues to have really big feelings about so um, little moments in your routine or some small thing will be the opportunity to have a really big upset this is actually a good sign and sometimes if you know if you know what the process is and you understand it and you know how to meet your child there and it doesn't and you work on the ways that it stresses you um, it's quite a good time sign and sometimes children will choose a pretext some little thing to get upset about that is so ridiculous that you can act I, I would when, when it used to happen to me, it was like I'd say, oh, okay, well, that's just not possible for someone to be that upset about that. So it must be about something else. The 
the great thing is we don't really need to know what it actually is about. Um, we can assume that if a child's having a whole bunch of feelings about something that doesn't make sense, that it's about something they're trying to work through and we can give them a hand there. An example I often quote is a child who was having, I was working with him and his mum and he was having a big upset and suddenly in the middle of it, he said, I have to floss my teeth. I must floss my teeth. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Nobody really needs, to, I mean, it'd be great if everyone flossed their teeth every day, but no one really has to, really needs to floss their teeth right now. So sometimes your child will reach for something that's so ridiculous that it reassures you. Um, and the other important thing to understand about this process is we're trained in our culture to stop people from feeling things. So we'll comfort them, we'll get them to calm down, we'll offer them a cup of tea, we'll distract them. And those strategies are useful sometimes, but they don't really work uh, over time. And the problem is that stopping a child from showing how they're feeling doesn't actually make the feeling go away. So when your child is regularly upset about leaving you for short, shortish periods of time and um, you are, I've lost my train of thought there. Oh, and you, so, so say you're leaving your child at preschool or childcare and they're very upset when you have to go and you go and then the childcare will often ring you and or suggest that you ring and more often than not you'll ring 10 or 15 minutes later and or they'll ring you and tell you that your child's fine and that's a really good sign but it doesn't mean that your child's feelings about separating from you have actually gone away they're just packed away so your child packs them away but they're sitting there getting in the way and may contribute to difficulties in other places. So just because someone has stopped showing that they're sad doesn't mean that they're not still sad. We don't have to worry about that, but it's good to understand that it's always helpful when the opportunity arises to let your child have those feelings um, and, and process them really and get them so that they're not actually holding them up so how does a child anybody actually um, process feelings so that they're not getting in the way of thinking and basically when a child feels safe um, they will if they've got feelings around they will seek to release those feelings and and Tears release stress and grief. It's a physical process. Tantrums, hot, vigorous tantrums, are actually the way that human beings release feelings of frustration. Um, sometimes it's difficult for us to imagine what that frustration might look like. But my example is that point at which you want to throw the computer out the window. That's how your child feels when they're having it you know just before they've had the tantrum um, is and frustration is a really important feeling to offload so that they uh, can get on with trying new things little ones are constantly trying new things so frustration is a fairly regular um, experience for little ones laughter is incredibly powerful and it actually is a way that human beings heal lighter fears and embarrassments which is kind of why a lot of comedy and humor um, gets a laugh around topics which are which we might be a little bit socially tense about that social tension of sort of not wanting to say the wrong thing or whatever, that's a little scary. And we get to laugh about that in jokes. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, mean jokes make sense, but that's what the process is. And that's why um, young people will laugh sometimes when they're in trouble, is that that the being in front of an adult who's tense in the kind of way we might be when our child has done something wrong, particularly if it's 
been unsafe. Um, children will sometimes laugh and it's not a sign of disrespect. It's a sign that they're offloading fear as they go. And then um, sometimes young ones will need to really struggle. It's a really hot, physical, sweaty, shaking, screaming process. And that too is usually a sign a child is offloading fear um, and it is part of the healing process. So we don't need to shut it down. We will sometimes struggle to listen to it and I think it's fine to say try to get out of it if you can. But, um, yeah, it's part of the process. So when our children hit that kind of spot, um, what they really need is they don't need time out. They need connection at that point. Often something's come up which has had which has had them feeling disconnected somehow or other, whether it's a big feeling or an experience or they actually have been away from you. But when children are off track, it's a sign that they need more connection and time in is the thing that will make the difference. Um, time out is what works for adults. When we've had enough, we need to get time out. And I'm a big fan of the strategic use of screens at times, at least when you've really had enough, because you're not much used to them when you've really had enough. Um, and ideally, we can work towards you not getting to the point where you've lost your patience, understanding the process and being able to intervene earlier. But basically, time in for children is our response when they've gone off track. So they experience some kind of emotional tension, they're feeling disconnected, they'll signal for help with off-track behaviour. And you really, you don't need to fix that problem that they're presenting necessarily. You can just bring a limit and say, no. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. And often what happens then is that your child starts to be upset. And if you can listen to those feelings, what you'll find is they're more relaxed on the other side of it. So around separations, what is it that we need to do? Um, well, it's useful to plan the great thing about separations is we know they get we know if if your child is unhappy about being separated from you this is a predictable experience you can actually think about when it when it happens what contributes to it and you can actually plan to help your child work through some of those feelings you'll do a better job of that at a time when you don't actually really need to be somewhere else or you don't really need to separate from your child. So you can plan this. Um, part of that plan will involve um, connecting and very deliberately connecting with your child to fill up their emotional cup or put plenty of connection deposits in your bank account. Then it makes it easier to set a limit. And around separation, the limit is basically that you're going to separate. If a child has big feelings about being away from you and big fe fears, then even just proposing that you'll be separated from one another, that you'll be going away, um, that will bring up feelings for them. And we can listen to those feelings and what we basically do is we work at a time almost of our choosing ideally we work at each little spot where our child starts to show us that they're agitated about us leaving and what you'll notice is that initially it may just take sweetheart later on I'm going to leave to go to work and that two hours beforehand may be enough to start to bring them to the point where they notice that you're going to leave and they notice they've got some feelings about it and they can start to sh sort of process those feelings. Um, that your job when that happens is to listen. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a progressive process through the process of getting more and more, bringing a bigger, uh, it, you, 
as you work through the feelings that they're carrying about it, um, you'll be able to have more of a sense, it'll take more of a sense of separation before they can notice that they've got feelings about it. Um, so initially, it may just be um, a proposal, I'm going to leave. And then I remember at a certain point, we did a lot of work um, with one family. And at one point, the thing that made the child start to be sad to notice that she was sad about her mum leaving was that her mum would pick up the car keys it's like she the little one knew that 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 meant her mum was serious so it's not it's not manipulative to try to do some of this work when you've got time to handle it one of the tricks about separation feelings children's feelings about separation is that it catches us when we're trying to leave almost by definition so anyway we talk about the long goodbye which is a, a process of st starting with the least amount of a sense of in separation that's about to happen through to actually leaving we can work on that spot as long as we have time to and then it's perfectly fine to leave you can leave um, your child will if they've got big feelings about you leaving um, they will find other times to work on that you'll need to be prepared to listen later to their upsets but you don't need to stay because your child is upset in fact in particular around daycare and school and childcare environments I recommend not hanging around um, it's better if you just leave and work on the feelings about being away from you other times when it comes up and then when you come back it's really important to reconnect and I'll talk about special time as a fantastic way of doing that so the plan um it needs to include time out for you. Some, I mean, it's useful to find yourself um, a good listener. And we recommend a thing, a process called a listening partnership that you can set up with another parent. I don't recommend it to do with your parenting partner, but you can. If you're thinking about that, come and see me and I can give you some tips. Having um, taught my husband to use this process, I learned a few things in the process. But generally, someone who's not so involved in your life is probably going to make a better listener. Um, it's just not so personal, I think. You're less likely to get reactive. But time out is a time where you can download your feelings. You can um, get some support, uh, make some plans, get some help. And time in for children is something that's good to plan for. Um, it's time in to build connection and time in to listen to feelings. And thinking and flexibility and confidence will follow. So when you're thinking about yourself, sometimes the issue around separation is actually more to do with us than it is to do with our children. So how do you, so you might take uh, some time in what we call a listening partnership. Um, you might take some time to talk about how you feel about leaving your child. A lot of the struggles that we have in our parenting is is to do with what happened to us when we were young and we channel that often in ways we're not really even aware of. So um, it's useful for you to think about when you encounter a, a regular spot of difficulty in your relationship with your child or a point in your routine that's consistently difficult. Um, it's worth asking yourself, what, what was it like for me when I was this age? Or what was this like for me when I was little? What do I remember about goodbyes? Uh, that is very useful in that it helps to drain some of the tension we're carrying from our own experiences. And most of us, most of us didn't get listened to. People didn't understand that stopping the feelings from showing didn't actually stop them from giving us trouble. So, yeah. 
So what were goodbyes like when you were a child? What would you need to do to plan for upsets? We have this, we're incredibly optimistic parents. <laughs> and we really do hope that even though leaving the house every time for the last three months has been difficult, um, we hope that this time we will, uh, we will, it'll go easily. And we really don't do ourselves any favours when we, when we go down that track. It's useful to, you know, it's actually not a bad thing to keep notes about where the snarls are, partly because when you figure out how to handle them and how to work through them with your child, you often are so busy and on to the next challenge that you don't notice that things have actually shifted and they're easier and you can go back and have a look and say, oh, yeah, we used to really have trouble getting out of the house. Like she would not put on her shoes. So um, it's good to plan and not hope it's going to be different. And with separations in particular, it's very useful to make time, to think about how you can make the time to slow everything down so that your child can actually have feelings about it and you're not just hustling them out of the house or um, losing your patience around a really long bedtime. So a listening partnership is a... Uh, a very useful tool. I don't think I could have parented well without it. Um, you want to find someone and make an, an explicit agreement with them that you'll take turns listening to, listening to each other. Um, and I recommend using a timer and you decide on how much time you've got and you divide it in half and one person listens and then you swap over when the timer goes off and the other person listens. A lot of time people, sometimes people feel like they haven't got anything to say. I haven't met anyone who with someone who's willing to listen to them without intervening or offering their opinion or giving advice, which those are very important things, um, doesn't find something to talk about. And I've done a lot of this and I notice in myself sometimes when I'm doing a listening partnership with someone who's really new to the process, people can sometimes find, take takes a while for them to find what they really want to talk about. And I notice my own temptation to step in and kind of ease, ease the situation. And if I don't do that, it's so interesting how often people will find something quite remarkable um, that their mind, your mind will find what you need to talk about and you don't really need suggestions from outside. And your job when you're the listener is to listen with warmth and your full attention and not to interrupt or give advice. And then it's very important. This is why it's quite useful to do it with someone that you don't have, don't have a complicated relationship with is to keep it confidential. So anything that you say inside of listening time needs to stay in listening time. It can be a bit tricky doing this with your friends because you're, in and out of conversations about things that you may well also talk about in your listening time. So it has to be navigated carefully, but it's a very, very powerful tool. And we really do need space to talk about parenting where we know we're not going to have to handle someone else's opinion, but they're just happy to listen to us. And often we'll get to feelings in that process. So part of our planning is to get a bit of slack for ourselves. Um, then the next process is to connect. And we recommend a kind of play called special time as an incredibly efficient way to connect. So special time builds a very deep sense of emotional safety in your relationship with your children. And it will let them carry the gift of your love with them when you're away from them. It's what they can hang on to and what will help them through times that they find difficult. So special time is, if you have more than one child, you're going to have to plan this. That'll be part of your planning. <laughs> um, what I have found is that uh, if, you, if you have to plan it, it becomes part of your routine. And I've noticed that parents who have scheduled in special time because the logistics require that, it tends to stick. It doesn't get lost in the busyness of life. And it's 
surprising. You would think it would be easier for parents of one child to to do plenty of special time. Um, special time is sometimes quite hard for us to do. So it's easy for it to drop off the calendar. And if we've got it in the calendar, that makes sense. Um, it, it keeps it there. So it's a one-on-one -on -one playtime. So one child, your child does, it won't work well for your child to be sharing their attention, your attention with another child. And even if that means you have to do it less often because you've got a couple of kids and it's it's tricky to figure out how to have only one at a time. Sometimes parents turn up, take turns, like one kid with one parent while the other kid does special time with the other parent. You'll probably need to be in different spaces. Um, you really want to try and keep it simple between you and the child, if there are other people around, whether it's their sibling or the other parent, um, unless that other parent is there with you doing special time, um, you can have the two of you and the one child. But the main important thing is that there's one child in this kind of play. And your job is to delight in them and tell them, I'll do whatever you want to do. Um, there's guaranteed to be some challenges in that. Uh, and if you decide to take on special time and then you find that it's gotten confusing or difficult, please get in touch with me. Um, but the fundamental principle is that this is, a, this is a time when your child has your full attention and uh, you're going to let them take the lead. That's really important partly because children will find ways of playing that actually tell you a whole lot of things about what they're thinking, what they're worrying about, what they're pleased about, what they need help with. And we're always, you know, chronically coming in to fix things up, to make things okay, to give suggestions. And children really do well with a, a, a time where they know they're they're in charge and they're going to get a break from us being the grown-up all the time, the one who's in charge. So a special time is one child. I recommend using a timer so that it's clear that this time is special. You announce it, whatever you want to do. Your goal is to offer extra warmth and eye contact and enthusiasm if the play ends up where there's laughter, that's good. But whatever you do, don't tickle. Tickling is actually not useful for young people. It puts them in a position where they can't, it, it, it disempowers them. It puts them in a position where they can't, they can't take charge. Some children will ask for tickling and you can work around that contact me and we can have a chat about it it's I think it's tickling it's sometimes the only way that adults in their life have been able to show them um, a lighter warmer contact but there's a hundred different better ways of doing it than tickling so for now just don't tickle um, and really do your best to not give them advice not give them instructions if they're asking you what to do you might be really silly and not know what to do or make stupid suggestions. They love it when we uh, take us take up a space that's where we're they're the competent, they're the one who knows, they're the one who can do things, and we're not so confident. A little bit cheerful. Um, it, it works really well. And special time is not conditional, so it's not that. Uh, if you will, if you if you're happy, you know, uh, we, let's we can do some special time if you manage to leave, be dropped off at childcare without any upset. It doesn't work that way. It needs to come in before things to plump them up or after things to fix them up. But it's not something that a child should have to work for or behave in a certain way to get. It'll be the solution to to problems um, rather than uh, some, something that's that you use as a kind of reward um, 
or withdraw as a kind of punishment. Rewards and punishments really aren't that useful. That's a whole other webinar. But generally, just do special time, plan it. If it's a regular thing, your child will look forward to it and don't make it conditional on anything. It will do its work uh, if you just do it. And then once you have a good, strong sense of connection with your child, um, what that will do is make it safer for you to set limits and to listen to upsets. So if if it oh, sorry, my hand. So if a child can hang on to a sense that you're on their side, when you set a limit, I'm going to leave now. I'm going to leave soon, sweetheart. You'll be fine. Um, then they they are it, they can kind of rest on a sense that we really are on their side to battle their way through this place where things are going in a direction they really not happy about. Um, and you can leave and yeah. So this is the listening bit. <clears throat> we call it the long goodbye. So choose a time when you've actually got time, when you don't actually necessarily have to leave or you've got some time, you know you've got some time before you leave. So I would recommend doing some special time early in the day. If, it's, if, if leaving the house in the morning is difficult, do some special time first thing. Children experience sleep as a profound separation. So they sometimes will wake up with feelings about having been away from you or feelings will have bubbled up while they're asleep. Um, it's good to reconnect in, in a solid way. So do, you could plan to do a little bit of special time early in the morning. And then when you've got time, what you will do is propose to leave, but you won't actually leave. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go, sweetheart. And then you'll notice that your child starts to get agitated, and you may need to make you know look like you a little bit like you are gonna leave, um, or whatever it is you have to do to get to the point where your child starts to be actively upset about you leaving. And then your job then is to listen. You don't need to say very much. In general, we talk about five words or less got to get it in front of the camera five words or less if you're saying more than five words you've shifted into a process which I call cognitive you're trying to reason with your child and your child's really not available for reason at that point where they're desperately upset about you leaving they need to be upset so you just need to keep it short and sweet and warm I'm I'm gonna leave hun I love you. You're safe. I'll always come back to you. When you say I'll always come back to you, it, it's not meant as a way of trying to get your child to calm down and understand that you're coming back. It's It works as a kind of lever off which a child can, like with the confidence of really knowing that you'll always come back to them, they can actually sob their heart out about how hard it is to be without you. Once they've got rid of those that big feeling, they'll be able to be without you without it being stressful, I promise. And you don't need to fix it. You don't need to give them another breastfeed in order that they you know, don't feel sad about the end of the day coming or, um, you know, um, staying at childcare. And if you go to my website, the link that I'll send, I've got a little video about why it's useful to drop and leave at childcare. But say trying to fix their sadness by hanging around at childcare before you, you know, until until they're happy often doesn't work very well. So you don't need to fix the thing that they say they're upset about, except if there's a safety issue. Of course, you have to fix the safety issue. And then you listen for as long as you can, and then um, you can leave. They may still be upset, but likely they won't stay upset. Um, it's not, it, they need to actually feel connected and emotionally safe to stay upset generally. So this, we call this time in, we call it stay listening. And so basically you'll move in close, you make it safe. So if they're thrashing around and likely to, you know, 
bump grandma's vase off the table, then move grandma's vase. Um, if they're sort of thrashing around and likely to hurt themselves or someone else, you might need to move them in close to you so that their thrashing arms can't do any damage. You want to make uh, time and space for the feelings they need to feel. You're really just saying, I'm going to leave, sweetheart. And you don't have to leave but at some point you may need to look like you're going to leave and the crying and the tantrum and the sweating those are the healing process so then you can leave you can just say goodbye and leave and then later on you'll need to reconnect so they'll need to be you'll need to put some connection deposits in the bank account after you've been away. Special time is a really fantastic way to do that. And then know that those little things that then your child gets upset about that don't make a heap of sense, all those little heartbreaks, they're a kind of gift. If you can understand that they're your child's way of saying, I'm hurting, I've got some feelings, I need to offload them, I'm going to decide this sandwich is cut the wrong way. <laughs> so you don't have to get into an argument about the sandwich, you can just decide effectively to set a limit at that point. Sweetheart, the sandwich is fine. I know, I know you don't want it to be cut that way. I know. That's what stay listening looks like often. So the gift of little heartbreaks. So that's about what I've got to say. Um, I love to hear how it's going. You'll get a recording and some links and do think about getting in touch with me. Um, I'm wondering if there's uh, any questions. Let me have a look. Ah, this is a great question. So is it possible to heal separation wounds for children years later? Yeah. Yes. Hi. There are. Oh. I can read them out for you. Okay, cool. With great got um, first of all a question from did you want me to read the questions uh it's open yeah it's a break from my voice if you if you can hi madeline i don't know if there's a delay did you want me to did you want me? I think I was had, had my volume down. Let me... Okay. You can read them if you want. Otherwise, I will. Put it... You right? Oh, thank you. Yeah. You're, okay. cu You're cutting in and out, okay. I think. Um, this one, I think you're cutting in and out, Carolyn. I might read them. I think, I think you're... A... Carolyn, I think you're cutting in and out. So, for a child to pull themselves back on track, when is Um, now you're on silent. I think I'll read it. So at what child is it appropriate for a child? What At what age is it appropriate for a child to pull themselves back on track? When is emotional self-regulation realistic? Um, it's a great question. Uh, our culture is really big on self-soothing and self-regulation. And it's very useful for a child to um, have that capacity. But if your child has, if their cup is overflowing or their backpack is too heavy 
or the relationship bank account doesn't have enough um, support. It doesn't have enough, it isn't plumped up enough. There's not enough credit in the relationship bank account. It's going to be really difficult for a child to do that. So it's a balancing act. I don't think there's any harm in uh, having diversion strategies available <laughs> if you can't handle it without being mean and nasty and critical of them. Um, as I said, I'm a, a great fan of the strategic use of screens at such times as we've got to the point where we can't handle it anymore. Um, but basically we're going to, if a child is consistently finding, if there's a point in your routine which is consistently difficult, um, your child needs to do some kind of emotional work there and expecting them to kind of be able to pull themselves out of that is unrealistic. So I don't know if that helps. I mean, I, at the end of, um, at the end of uh, adult to adult listening time, we often propose a silly question or which is really about making sure that the person at the end of listening time is out of whatever it is they were talking about. And I taught my daughter that process so that I remember using it um, at school, like when she was upset about having to go into the classroom. We'd done quite a lot of work around letting her be upset about separations. But sometimes I would, we would sit on, I remember sitting in the room and looking around, how many different pictures can you see? What colour blue can you see? I'm not recommending that you actually, you don't, if, if you can pull that off, then great. <laughs> but the point is, one day she came home and told me that her little friend at school was upset and so she'd sat down and helped her notice how many trees there were in the playground. Like it's actually a useful skill but if a child is is really needing to have an upset, it's probably not going to work, if that makes sense. Um, so... Uh, someone had asked, is it possible to heal separation wounds, wounds for a child years later? Like if you left them at daycare when they were one and they are now five, how do you know if they are sad and just now showing it? And what I'd say is um, I don't think it matters. I think quite a lot of the time our children will have had experiences that no one knew how to help them with or we didn't weren't we were sufficiently stressed that we didn't notice or somehow the situation meant that they didn't get to have those feelings then in a way it's reassuring that our children will find ways to bring that up and you can pretty well be sure that uh, particularly when they're getting upset around stuff that completely doesn't make sense. That's almost absolutely them telling you something happened to me and I need to work it through and I'm going to choose. I can't really tell you how big it was. Um, I almost think that the smaller the pretext, the bigger the, bigger the feeling. But we worry a lot about our children's we can get worried about helping them recover and I think we don't need to worry we just need to take those opportunities when they present and assume that they're about some earlier experience ultimately for human beings the problem I mean it is important to protect ourselves from unsafe and damaging experiences but often the issue is not so much that the experience was hard and damaging it's that we never got to talk about it we never got to recover from it if we get to recover from those stressful experiences the ex the the information contained in the experience becomes useful to us rather than being coated in a whole lot of heavy feelings so human beings can endure the most extraordinary 
extraordinarily hard experiences if we get a chance to be listened to about how it made us feel. And in that listening process, the tension around the experience is resolved and we are then able to use that experience to inform good decision making in future. So you can be confident that whenever you get a chance and can organize yourself to listen to your child, child's upset that it's doing good work. Um, all right. Let me just read this question. Yeah. Okay. This is a great question too. If we are going away for a night or a few days, I tend not to tell my kids until the morning of. My son, who is six, tends to fret and get really anxious with the anticipation of me leaving. So it's not helpful to tell him earlier than this. Do you think that planning, quote, unquote, <laughs> is appropriate or would you recommend working through it earlier? I actually think that planning is part of what, your plan would involve um, um, telling him earlier. So we often put off bad news <laughs> or something that we know is going to upset our child um, until we, we, we can often try to avoid it or put it off until the last minute. And sometimes that makes sense. Um, what I love about the hand-in-hand -hand approach is that it's not a one-size-fits-all and it's not going to be this what makes sense today isn't necessarily what's going to make sense tomorrow but the guiding principles are you need to be have your eye on how connected you you are in your relationship with your child and on where it might make sense to set some limits so some some emotional tensions can be brought up to the surface and dealt with um, and that process of balancing those two things will vary from day to day or even hour to hour so you know one day it makes sense may make sense to stick them all in front of the telly in the morning so you can get the lunches cut another day that's not something that you'll need to do it doesn't really matter that much we get very very stuck on consistency but that's also a whole other um, webinar but basically I would be recommending that you I assume you're talking about you're going away from your children. I would tell them as soon as you know that you're going away. I would tell your six-year-old, honey, in a week I'm going to be going away and see what, what, he, does, he, what he does with that. Um, if it, it, he may sort of refuse to notice <laughs> and and that's about that's about how hard it is to have those feelings of sadness so you'll want to figure out some way of it's a process of bringing the reality of the separation to his attention the actual separation isn't quite so important a fit for, for most of the project, but he needs to be able to notice that you're going to leave. So you might do things that and draw his attention to the things that you might have to do if you're going to plan to go away for a few days. So you might pack your bag and get him to come, tell him that you're going to pack your bag and, and have him notice that you're doing that because you're going to go away. You, you're not trying to you're not trying to get him used to the idea, although if he gets to process his sadness about you leaving, he will get used to the idea. But um, you're trying to give him an opportunity to have some feelings about the fact that you're going to be away from him. So the if the fretting and the anxiety that your son's showing is actually the feeling that's trying to get out um, so what you want to do is figure out ways to get that feeling out sometimes um, if you know that he's sort of going to get anxious um, 
there's some ways of playing which are particularly useful and any play that we call it play listening but it's play that puts him in charge that has him being the most um the 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 competent one the one who can handle things and your job is to in this kind of play to be sort of a bit dumb fairly cheerful you don't want to be um unhappy about it but kind of confused and a bit muddle-headed um so you may find he sets up games where he's leaving and you could maybe um want to go with him try and put propose that you might hop in his hop in his suitcase or beg him to take you with you or and what you'll if you get it right you'll notice that he will laugh and that laughter and and games which can kind of just stay on the edge of that laughter are incredibly useful for um helping a child work through lighter lighter fears um and if a child's really anxious you may be able to uh work through some of it that way it, it's a it's a very lovely way to work with fear because it's 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 very connected and it's not direct um you know if we're always moving if we notice our child has a struggle and we're always moving in directly to kind of intervene um sometimes that can be a bit hard on a child so um chasing games hiding games games that play around with the idea of connection and separation may be a useful thing if your child's particularly anxious but i definitely would be trying not to spring it on them out of out we do it because we we don't want to upset them but actually what you want to do is get him to the point where he can have that upset while he's safe enough in your arms that it's safe enough for him to feel it because it'll be getting in his way in any number of other other areas of his life so i hope that's I hope that I hope I got your question right and I hope that it uh that that that, I, that that helps. So um I think that might be that looks like I've been helpful to that person. <laughs> They just left a message. So I think that's all that's there at the moment. Let me have a quick look here. Yeah, I think that's all for the moment. So we could wrap up if you like. Carolyn, we can be brave and see if Let me try. Do okay, that's me? better. I don't know what happened. I'm so know. sorry. I wasn't it doesn't matter, that's fine. Question. That's why there's two of us. Out. Um great. Well, thank you so much, Madeline. I my favorite part is hearing you tell people they are good parents. Yes. I love that. <laughs> And everyone is doing the best they can. It's very comforting and it's also true. So thank you so much for your wealth of wisdom and knowledge and care. And as mentioned, we will be sending out the recording and Madeline's offer of the free 20-minute um, consultation. Also, don't worry about your email. It will only be used for this purpose. Um, when you do receive the email. So it won't be put on a marketing list or you won't be receiving anything else. So thank you very much for attending. And did you want to say anything in closing, Madeline? No, thank you for making the time to come, lovely parents. Um, yeah, it, you're you busy were... and, you know, go well. I'd love to hear from yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. And it's great that everyone cares so much to attend. So Thank you very much again, Madeline, and everyone have a wonderful day. Okay. Bye-bye. See you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.